we have Janine Feng, the Managing Director at Carlisle Group. We have Stephanie Huey, the Managing Director at Goldman Sachs. We have Michelle Nip Lung, uh, the founding partner and CIO at Jing Time Capital. And right here, we've got Wendy, uh, Wendy Zhu, the Managing Director at Alpha Invest Partners Limited. I'm going to start by posing my first question to you, Stephanie. You have had a variety of experiences. You've spent most of your career at, at uh, Goldman Sachs. You run the private equity group there, uh, excluding Japan here in Asia. What attracted you initially to private equity, and how did Goldman Sachs really bolster your experience? So I have to be honest here, I stumbled into this industry. It was not planned. Um, and I went to school thinking I was going to be a doctor. I graduated early from college. I did it in three years. And afterwards, I thought I should earn some money to pay for medical school. And at the time at school, everybody was going into Wall Street. So I was very curious. And I applied for a Goldman. Um, and when I was interviewing one of the guys who's currently in the industry, very famous person, Joe Bay, he was my shepherd, and he basically said, look, if they ask you, just say you want to be in private equity. And then I said, it's a lie. They told you to lie. I was like, what is it? And then he goes, he explains to me. So that was very helpful for my interview process. So he was my first mentor, if you will, to go into the industry. That's how I stumbled into this industry. I started with thinking I was going to be here for one year, and I actually lasted, this is my 17th year in the group. Uh, and so I really liked it. Um, to put it in the woman's term, this is a job where someone finds you the money, you spend the money and buy whatever you want as long as it has good returns. So it's the woman's dream job. So it's actually baffles me that there's not more women in this industry. But surely there must have been a point throughout those 17 years where you sat back thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I'm not going to the office the next day. Was there another experience like that? And what was the catalyst for that experience, if so? I think you're going to talk a lot more about work-life balance later, but it's the first time it happened was when I had my first kid. And the trouble with this job is it's a ton of travel. I mean, we always see each other at the airports. Uh, and so that was the instigation for that. Okay. But otherwise, I love this job. Okay. Michelle, I'm going to ask you the next question. You have had uh, a very interesting career. You've kind of done a little bit of everything from um, switching to running Tom.com as well as starting your career in investment banking. You now run your own hedge fund. What has it been like to run your own hedge fund? And, has being a woman been an asset, or has it been a hindrance in that regard? Um, I don't think it's been a hindrance. Can you hear me a lot? Yes. Um, I think that um, for me, at least my, my career, gender has not been a big issue. I, I haven't felt that being a woman is different from, from yeah, being in a male dominated native environment. Um, I actually started my career at the UN. Uh, I was in peacekeeping right out of college. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, early twenties. And when I was in a mission in Cambodia and South Africa, I was working with men twenty years older than myself. And all generally all male. And in many cases I was the one with, you know, better management skills and so I took a more of a leadership role in, in many cases I found. Um, and after that I was, like many of us here at HBS and then at Goldman all sort of male-dominated environments. But I don't think that at any point I felt that I was disadvantaged as a woman. Um, most recently, so I've spent the last five years in private equity uh, as a partner at Luna Capital. Um, Luna Capital um, focuses on middle market buyout in the China market. And uh, recently, I've spun out with a team from Luna to launch Xingtai which is a long-biased absolute return hedge fund focused on listed Chinese consumer companies. Um, and so I guess in, in many ways, I think being a woman, there's a scarcity value. You're able to differentiate more easily in many ways. Um, so in my experience, it has not been a disadvantage. Mm. Hmm. Jimmy, what about you? When you think about your career, you were the one of the first 100 employees at, at, at Carlisle Group. You were, in fact, interviewed by Dave Rubenstein, one of the founders of that prestigious company. What was your experience like from the beginning, and how has your experience evolved being there? Um, well, you know, I grew up in Shanghai, so uh, I only went to the U.S. when I was a sophomore in college. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you didn't know anything, so you went, I, I came out of college, and, uh, and I just went out on Wall Street, and it's, and it's like a, one of those popular things. And, um, and uh, you've never been to corporate America before, you felt like this is probably just the way it is. Now, 
growing growing China, there's one thing good about that is that uh, Chairman Mao told us when I was already that the woman <laughs> occupies half the sky. So <laughs> that does help you in some perspective when you see um, that just the society and how your mom, uh, my mom's generation, everybody work. Um, that does help. And uh, now I st I also stumble upon that this this. Uh, um, private equity and without knowing much about it. Um, and, uh, you know, talking about Carla, I joined Carla 15, 16 years ago. Um, now, back then, it's about 100 some total employees. And uh, back then, I was an associate. Um, you'd be surprised when the associate and the founder somehow interview you. <laughs> Today, it's not the case. But I joined as the first um, female investment professional. Um, and uh, back in Carlisle at that, that time, and today um, we have 40% of employees are women in Car at Carlisle, oh, yeah. and uh, um, over 15% are investment professionals are women. And I think that percentage actually um, quite large for my team. I oversee our China investment. Um, on my team, we have over 35% women are uh, China team. So it has come from um, a long way. Uh, in terms of uh, the representation of female uh, professionals. So I think it does create a pretty good environment for me and uh, um, the rest of the investment professionals or other uh, female employees to um, continue to work. So I think it's been a good experience. Before I ask Wendy the next question, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you guys are currently working in private equity? And how many people here are because they aspire to work in private equity? <laughs> well, that's great, that's great. We're, hopefully this information is going to help both sets of, of those. Yeah. Wendy, question for you. You have a unique perspective in the sense that you work for a limited partner, Alpha Invest. What has been your experience like as a woman within that company? Sure. Um, I, you know, before I start, I just want to say that I'm very honored to be here. I think, you know, Janine and Stephanie and Michelle, these are celebrities in our industry, so mm -hmm. I'm very honored to be here sharing this experience. And I'm also very nervous as well. I'm just saying, I just did a panel this morning for ABCJ, but uh, not nearly as nervous, because there's nothing worse than be, to be uh, than being judged by your own kind. So I'm very, <laughs> very, very, very concerned here. But anyways, um, going back to your question, I was just thinking about this topic, and I was thinking, you know, Janine's been with Carla Group for, you know, sort of 15 years, and Stephanie 17 years. And I've been in this industry as an LP role, so really for about 16, 17 years. We'll sort of stay made, started around the same time frame as well. I think what women bring to the table is longevity and consistency. I see a lot of my female friends, their career development actually has preceded their husbands or boyfriends <laughs> and men of you know, their same generation. And a big reason for that is, is be persistent and uh, be able to pursue one career rather than you know, moving around. Uh, into completely different fields, uh, develop that expertise, and in none other than private equity where your experience the track record is rewarded more so than any other industry. So from that perspective, you actually have advantage of uh, being sticking to, to one thing. And if you are with the right platform, in the case of Carlisle or Goldman, obviously that's going to take you to a long, long way. So I think, if anything, that's sort of something I can draw from this, this panel <coughs> alone in terms of you know, key to success in, in our industry and, and being a woman somehow I contributed to that as well. So, Michelle, when I listen to what Wendy has to say, I hear that women are amazing, they're rock stars. So why aren't more women in this industry? When I take a look at the statistics from Frequent, it says that uh, women account for 13% of high-level private equity roles in Asia as compared to 10.3% in North America, close to 10% in Europe, and then 10% in the rest of the world. It seems that Asia is more geared to having women be in these roles. Number one, why do you think that is? And then number two, talk a little bit about how we can get more women in the front, call it the producer roles within the private equity shops. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a couple of factors. I mean, one, we were talking, chatting about this before, I think, you know, the last 20 years were quite tougher. Um, there were fewer women in leadership positions. I think the coming 20 years, with more women in leadership positions, I think it will be easier for the next wave of women coming in. Um, I think the key is women supporting women in many ways. I mean, organizations like this, um, women in leadership roles, promoting women, mentoring women, rather than shutting out women coming in the door. That, that's really critical. Um, I think another critical aspect would be 
building in some kind of more institutionalized flexibility for women at certain stages of their, of their career. Um, and having probably the right support network. But maybe what we're finding in Asia is that there's maybe more support network outside within the family or within other frameworks that so women are able to pursue their careers because they have that support. Um, the cheaper access to help. The cheaper access to help, the, the family that's around to help out as, as, as um, yeah, parent, with the parenting mm -hmm. responsibilities. Um, the multitude of those, those factors, I think. So it's interesting because you said something about, you know, once a woman gets their foot in the door, let's say that, what's the biggest block for why they wouldn't propel themselves or escalate themselves within the company, you think? I think women are not great self-promoters. You know, um, in general, men are more aggressive about presenting themselves, about forging, the, you know, pushing themselves to the forefront. Women are more in the background. They tend to reserve opinion. They tend to be modest about what they've done. They tend to measure, you know, be measured about talking about themselves. Um, that's certainly one aspect. And I think in general, like, I would say probably, in my experience in the last 20 years, I mean, women have not always been supportive to other women, in my experience, in the last 20 years. Um, at least in institutions I was in, um, the women were not the ones coming, reaching out and helping out. So, mm -hmm. not in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it would it would help if that changed. Um, the peer to peer support is really critical, um, and some kind of built in you know flexibility in workplace arrangements. I yeah. think. Um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg talks a lot about this in her book Lean In, um, and it's more relevant in the U.S. context. But I think the mindset of of that is very critical. I think most women who have some flexibility in the workplace yeah. um, actually respect it. You know, they, they're not going to slack off. Yeah. Just because they go home for, from 5 to 6.30, they go back to work at 8 p.m. Yeah. Um, and women are very diligent about that. I don't think they would slack off if they had a modicum of flexibility within, within certain stages of their career. And that would help enormously in the longer term. It's a great point. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys feel this way, but I feel like this all the time where I feel scared to have that conversation with my manager about things. I get like the butterflies, I get nervous, and I've gone up to all the great schools and I feel like I should know how to do this. And I tell my husband this and he just looks at me like, why don't you just go ask the question? Because you don't know the answers. You need to find out the question. But I get really, really scared and I don't want to come across as aggressive or pushy, but sometimes that's what I need to do. So. Janine, any comments on how you went to great schools also? So it's not that you have to go to these great schools to learn this. How did you learn to present yourself and to not necessarily demand what you want, but to make your claims and, and, and express what you need in terms of the support? Well, I, I think um, partially just uh, it's, a, it's a mental um, preparation. And just, uh, you know, I, I'm always very direct and uh, I'm always very... Um, somewhat opinionated about things and uh, uh, somewhat helps and uh, you, you just really have to speak up and I think women tend, I think they agree with the show, tend to be, you know, um, kind of uh, uh, half glass empty um, type of syndrome. But uh, you really need to be, uh, if I look at all these, um, you know, 16 years in this industry and I, if I look at some of the people that are very successful, uh, in our industry is, uh, in, as a woman, you really just have to speak up. And uh, when you give it a chance, you better grab it. Um, and a lot of women decided there may be the next chance and not very confident. And you really have to, over time, develop that and be confident about it. And th to do that, you, you, you do have to do some work. And um, you just want to grab chance. And uh, so that's, I think that's very important. And I found many, many women who um, I can see some of my social VP nurses um, that uh, sometimes they mm, decided to pass on chance, you know, mm -hmm. and they just decide to let the, the next guy say the right thing or at that moment. Um, I think sometimes you just have to be, uh, grab that chance. Mm -hmm. Someone once said to me, speak up, and if you can't speak up, practice. Practice <laughs> <laughs> in front of a mirror. That's yeah, right. I have women who, um, you know, we do these portfolio reviews sometimes, and um, Sometimes they uh, they said, oh, okay, how about somebody else say it? And I said, well, why don't you say it? Well, oh, uh, I said, okay, this is what you do. You're gonna be writing that out, and you're gonna read. <laughs> and uh, and she and she did that, and she did two, three months in a row, and then she was good at it afterwards. So I think she, in the beginning she said, I don't want to do it. I have this VP do it. 
Um, but I think you just have to put yourself out of it, uh, out and, yeah. and accept some kind of failure. Yeah, absolutely. You'd be comfortable also having those difficult conversations. Question to both of you, because you both work for what I would consider established companies. You talked a little bit about how a woman could be more uh, accommodative in helping themselves grow within a company. But what about the company? What can the company offer in terms of perhaps these flexible arrangements? You alluded to earlier that perhaps when you wanted to exit the building was when you had your first child. There, surely there must be uh, implementations that the companies can think about to, to make that easier, to make the onboarding easier when you come back from, for example, maternity leave or what have you. I mean, from Goldman's perspective, I have I've been very grateful. I've been allocated a mentor to me who was a woman, but frankly, the, the informal mentor is actually way more important, and I have built these relationships all the time. So I've seen people who have done it, so it's nothing magical. Um, and actually, just touching on the point you were talking about, all of us, when we were growing up as girls, particularly in Asia, People are going to tell you that you're timid. People are going to tell you you need to speak up. But I don't think we should see ourselves in character formation as like a static point. We all evolve. And frankly, the more kids you have, the more fearless you become. <laughs> like, I have no grounds to tell any guys about anything today. I have three boys at home. Um, and so I think you know, over a period of time you grow, you become more confident. And I, I laugh at my own reviews now, but I look at those that are 10 years old. They were like, you were timid. I'm, and my husband was like, you were timid? Like, <laughs> so I think the firm helped us a lot in terms of showing us the path. But the firm also gives us a lot of feedback over the period of time. And I didn't use any of the flexi work hours because I didn't want the guys to kind of look at me and say, are you taking the easy way out or not? But there was plenty of opportunities available for us at the firm. Yeah. Um, and it just depends on whether Is you Is there ever a scenario, though, where a woman can take that? Or yes, absolutely, absolutely. And we have, we actually have a very good example in our workplace where someone actually took an administrative role while they were having um, twins. And then after so she was in the producer role she before? She was producer role and say, sorry, I want to take the administrator role during the twins. Because it's very tough on the body if you have twins. I've never had twins. But then um, after she had the twins and she was like, I'm done with kids now, she said, I want to go back into the producer role. And she was a total star. And she blew everybody away in terms of the return path. Mm -hmm. And she was not set back in terms of the promotional path relative to any of the guys. In fact, mm -hmm. the guys were shocked how fast she actually got back into shape. So I think it's a matter of will. It's a matter of passion. Like she goes all the way out in terms of like sourcing deals, and she's so efficient. Mm. You should see her to-do list. But I, I really think um, taking a step back and then you know having your kids and coming back is total doable. And asking for those opportunities if you don't work for a big firm, I have to imagine is also a priority. Yeah, I think um, for all of us, I think obviously um, you know for platforms like Goldman has a very much more institutional. Uh, we're managing it, and for us, you know, obviously a much smaller platform, but I think the culture helps, um, and um, I think, you know, our culture tends to be quite team-oriented and kind of like Goldman, and also quite family-oriented. You know, I, I, I think when I first joined, um, you know, I, I, I was uh, in the middle of, uh, clo I was a VP then later on, and I was in the middle of a closing, a, a literally closing deal, like a supposed close next week. But uh, I, I had a wedding um, that Saturday, my own wedding. Then I thought, okay, uh, you know, I came from investment banking, so I said, okay, this is gonna be like my honeymoon is gonna be postponed, and uh, because I was ready for it, because I, I said, okay, I. Right. So I get myself ready, like, okay, I'm just going to go Saturday, Sunday for wedding, then I can be back on Monday. Um, and, uh, you know, just because your VP in clothing is very important when you're VP. Um, so, and, and I think my MD is a, is a man, um, and uh, very, literally was kind of amazing, said, oh, uh, oh, yeah, you have wedding. You are wedding. And, uh, um, you know, don't worry about it, and, uh, you know, I'll cover for you. And I saw. What? Um, so I think it's, I, I felt quite good. Uh, I feel, you know, very different um, as a kind of culture. And I try to carry that for the next, my, by the way, my own managing people. And I, you know, you don't give um, women in our organization don't feel like when they're pregnant, it's like, oh, you know, everybody looking differently or something, they look just normal. And we have make arrangements such that you know you can have four months off, um, and uh, you know we have 
kind of... Do people take the four months? You know, you yeah. always hear people about the Lisa Myers of the world who two weeks People later. take four months, and I encourage people to take four months. And, uh, I, you know, one thing you, you realize in life that uh, sometimes you not as... Uh, you know, in the sense of as you think you, you know, some, and uh, um, in a sense you make the arrangement and every the team knows, understands ahead of time and plan it, um, and then the university company understands, all the company, and you, met, you make a lot of arrangement ahead of time. And I think that it's a good transition when she comes back, it just flips over, and I think we have been going through that in our my team for many times now, and uh, I think it works well, and these people not put back because of their pregnancy or others. I think it, it, you know you have such environment, and then it, it's it's it, it works better for the next associate joint. Yeah, once you change your diaper, you can do anything. I have to imagine, Wendy, that uh, what has it for? I'm not going to imagine. You tell us what has it been like for you in terms of establishing that equilibrium between work-life balance. I mean, I, I just want to comment that I think, you know, there's no illusions. I think all the women in, in the industry have to put in the hard work. And if anything, I would, I would think that you're working harder than men because if you don't communicate uh, your achievements, uh, you really have to deliver through what you can deliver, which means track record, you know, you really have to make money. I know you all have for, for your firm. Without those real numbers, you're not going to be sitting here today. So uh, there's no illusion that it's not, it's not a walk in the park. I think. Um, you know, just on pregnancy alone, I mean, our office, we have quite a bit of women, but uh, our, we're famous for staying in office on Thursday, deliver on Friday morning. It's been it happened three times with three different uh, professionals already, and not by chance, but we, you know, we, tra we travel, travel almost up until the last, you know, couple months. So, uh, people are willing to do that because there's a commitment to the job they do, and I think women particularly are committed to their, their jobs and, uh, and deliver to better, you know, be to, to, you know, do the best they can. Um, on the balance, I mean, I, I really have to say, you know, my job is probably the easiest on this table because um, I have a lot more predict predictability with my job. Um, the fundraising period tends to be fairly long, so there's predictable. I, I almost know, you know, I'm going to be out of town next month, the following month, the following month. Um, I, I can plan out my calendar almost six months in ahead. Doesn't mean I travel any less. I still I cover the regions more of a, you know, sort of, a, sort of. Uh, broader base, so I cover Asia region, so travel will be from Australia to India to Southeast Asia, but you know, sort of um, the people I deal with in terms of the, 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 the actual schedule is much more manageable. So I think, you know, I'm really not the one to speak here. I probably have the easiest job uh, on, this, on this panel. Um, but uh, we are very lucky in Asia that we have help um, at home. I, I cannot imagine how in the U.S. or in European, mm -hmm. or in other parts of the world, people do it. I think that's also the reason why the number in Asia actually does not look bad. It's, it's yeah. really almost 100% mm -hmm. the reason why we, we have a number what it is today, so that you are you know, back in fighting for very, very short, very quickly after that as well. So, But I'll let the other women mm -hmm. share their experience, because I, I know they have a lot more to share on that. Any other questions at this point? I thought I saw a hand in the back. Okay. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. And let's talk one point. Yeah, uh, I want to add, but you know, I think the critical thing is having women leadership roles, like what Jeannie's talked about. You know, she has now brought in more women within Carlisle. You know, what's needed in the industry is that, for example, more women-led or women-founded firms should be backed by, you know, by LPs. You know, that that's critical. All these examples of women able to do this um, will foster a change. I think that that's it's it's just it's. At the end of the day, it's role models, it's examples, it's other people who have done it that will make the change and give confidence to other women. I'm so sorry I'm interrupting, but there's like one thing, women tend to victimize ourselves. It's kind of like, oh, I can't do this, right? But I'll just give you an example. When I was pregnant, um, I think seven months pregnant with the first one, I was negotiating at the table and the, the entrepreneur was like, it's late, let's go and have a meal. I was like, sorry, like, let's just finish this first before we go. So he called my boss in the end and he goes, it's so unfair, you sent this seven month old woman who's refusing food and negotiating. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say yes because I don't want her baby to be hungry. <laughs> so a light just dawned on me, it's like, we feel sorry for ourselves when we're in this type of situation, but in reality is, you know, like it could actually, like being a woman can be different in a room, it can actually work to your advantage. <laughs> you know, that's a bit of joking aside, but you know, that's, how I see it's like half empty, half full. It's it applies to yourself. And yeah. You said something interesting, Michelle. And there's a statistic from the World uh, 
Bank's World Development Report that says that women-owned businesses account for only 3% of venture capital investments globally. You talk about the need to have more of those businesses owned by women, but why, what can be done to increase that number, and why is it so low to begin with? Um, I mean, why is it so low? I don't know. It's a complicated, I think it's a complicated uh, situation. Probably, partly, it's institutional and cultural. You know, uh, men are backing men, and there's, there's a bit of that going on. Um, a lot of women are opting out, like we talked about. You know, it's too life, too difficult to, to, to um, balance work-life issues. It's, uh, you know, why why go there? So that, that's a lot of that going on, I think. Um, but I think it's critical that that happens more. Um, and I, I, I think your question is more like, so if you were running a business and you want to raise money from a VC or a yeah. private fund, what yeah, would what you do? Yeah, what can women do to get on your radar, on someone's radar? I mean, I think first of all, I think going back to what Stephanie said earlier, I think, um, Passion is really critical. Whether you're starting a company, running a company, or doing this job, I mean, you have to really like what you do, and you have to be driven to succeed in what you do. So, you know, you have to be true to yourself. So, is this really what I want to do? If if you really want to start the company, and you want to go out and raise money for it. If you're passionate and you're diligent, you know, you're you're halfway there to some extent. Um, but I don't think there's a gender issue involved in terms of you know if you have. A sound business model, the right strategy, the right competitive positioning, a right track record, you, know, you will get funding, right? Whether whether you're a man or a woman, to some extent. Um, but but I think that being a woman as an entrepreneur, I think that um, the advice I would give is, it's tough, you know, being an entrepreneur. I mean, it's a it's a 24/7 undertaking. Even if you have greater flexibility, um, you, you're living with with the stress more, and you have to be able to handle that stress. Um, in the workplace, but also emotionally, mm -hmm. being able to ride out market cycles, ride out mm -hmm. cycles within the company's development. And if you're someone who can ride out that kind of stress, and um, then probably, you know, you, whether male or female, you're equipped to, to raise money for your company. I, think that's I mean, um, what you just said earlier in terms of whether LPs or investors are backing up, uh, you know, women-led funds or women-led companies, I mean, there is a Oh, there's a there's definitely that movement. I mean, the, the pension funds they will be brilliant to just back in sort of minority women-led funds or 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 private private equity venture or other businesses. I think there's there's definitely that recognition that this is something that you know at least a, a huge part of a huge capital base in the world that's willing to to to, to back. What do you think of that quota? Just to yeah. check the box. Um, well, I mean, this particular investor is a very big investor, so billing for them is still sort of a you know percentage, uh, you know, single digits percentage of the overall portfolio. But I think by sure dollar amount, that's a pretty sizable dollar amount, and there's continuum of where, where that will come from. I think um, so. It's, it's a small step, but I think I'm a little bit too too um, mind about this because on one way I want women to win out on merits, and not because right. you know sort of uh, checking the box exactly someone give you the money, you know, it's like a charity or whatnot, but. But on the other hand, it also needs to, you know, be there to, to support uh, some of these uh, initiatives, so to, to demonstrate, give you an opportunity that you might not other, otherwise have. So I'm a little too minded about this, but I think um, if I look at the performance, actually it's quite good. So, you know, there's nothing there to say that this is going to be underperforming the sort of the average, you know, sort of portfolio. So it's, 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 uh, it's interesting. You know, I don't know a lot about it, but, uh, you know, that, uh, I think it's definitely happening and uh, hopefully a positive for everyone, you know, sitting here today. We're going to switch gears a little bit because there's a variety of backgrounds and experiences in the audience. Let's just go around the semicircle here and what are some of the key skills, qualifications you need? Because surely when you guys enter the industry, it's perhaps different than, than now. And I know a variety of you guys have, or many of you guys have um, MBAs, but I don't want people thinking here that you need to go to X school, you have to have X background for you to break into this industry. So perhaps share some experience on, on what you're seeing now when you go through the interview, when you interview others. Um, I, I think clearly, obviously, there's a there's an expected um, intelligence, um, uh, you know, required. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but I assume you know a lot of those. And uh, but but I think there's a in our business, it's a long term business. So um, people need to come with a long term commitment and. Uh, um, and uh, I think that's part of, I think, uh, for anybody, whether it's man or woman, um, you know, you do have to um, be prepared to make a, a longer, longer term commitment to make it more economically um, uh, uh, interesting and everything, and, and career-wise. And, um, and secondly, secondly, you have to like uh, 
our, you know, the big part of the job um, is meeting various companies. Um, I happen to lot love it, and um, I, I think you do. You know, it, what it does is it requires you to travel everywhere. Um, so if you um, not committed to that, that's also a bit of a, a bit of an issue because it does bring you to, you know, anywhere kind of in the country. It could be fifty cities of China somewhere, um, and you're meeting, you know, not very like type of people. Um, and uh, but you have to really love that. And, uh, and 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 because it's a long term business, you have to. Um, the most important thing about our business is not just the kind of doing that deal, and it's much more about what you do afterwards. Um, so it is, um, it, you have to have that skill and the patience and, uh, and also um, uh, commercial sense to work with people. I think that's kind of very, very important in our business. Yeah, I would agree. I think IQ, EQ, EQ because everybody has a lot of capital these days. So they actually, the, the portfolio company needs to like you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need to hold proper coffee conversations or lunch conversations. So, uh, so EQ, IQ, and I think judgment is the key because if you have bad judgment, you know, make a bad deal, you get fired pretty quickly. Um, and then I think the last thing um, is really the body. Uh, sleeping, you have to be able to sleep in different hotels five nights in different <laughs> hotels. You have to sleep on planes. You have to eat food on planes um, a lot. So the stamina for the physical requirement is actually pretty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I you know, I love to share about, you know, how to bring young people in the industry. I think one is you have to know what product it really is. I interview a lot of people who would come and say, I just want to be on the buy side. So <laughs> I mean that's really very typical. I'm sure you got that as well. I wanna be I am now on the sell side, I wanna be on the buy side. So what does the buy side really mean? Do you really know what you're getting yourself into? What does private really spell for you? Uh, so that's really know what you're actually getting into, I think is very important because it's a long term business. How do you learn that? How do you learn you that? Encourage I mean, there are so. I would say five years ago it was difficult because of the early stage industry. Now there's so many, you know, seminars you can go to. People that work in the industry. There's so many people. It's, it's a mature industry now in, in Asia. So a lot of people you can talk to that work in the industry. You can get a lot of information from them, even through websites. A lot of the websites of different firms, of, you know, offer portfolio company breakdowns and things like that. So there are a lot of research you can do. So there's really no excuse. If you're stepping the door, you should really know who you're talking to and what industry you're trying to get into. So that's one too. I really agree with Stephanie. I think. EQ is so much more important than IQ in our business. It's really the relationship building. That's why women, I think, actually have advantage because that relationship building comes so naturally for us. Mm -hmm. Where I think for you know men or you know younger younger professionals, they need to really build that. You know how to reach out, how to build rapport, how to make people like you. That's really important. Um, and then and then think and, and not just execute. I think the problem with women is we tend to execute a lot. We, we are very good at processing, writing a paper, writing a memo, you know, do something and put the numbers, make sure everything will click and, 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 and put together. You know, that's a being conference job. This is, you know, this is really about thinking and looking to the future and really kind of, you know, fundamentally believing something. So, you know, that's where we're going to differentiate you from being associate director into the next level, which is a partner level, really make decisions. So I think those are some of the things. That may, obviously, not going to get there in day one, but you know, try to think along those lines. And also, I really believe another thing: if you like industry, you like a business, you got to start early. I think a lot of people, oh, I'm going to be consultant for a couple of years, banker for another couple of years, and now I'll figure out what I'm going to do after that. Or maybe I'll go to MBA, and after that, I'll figure out what I'm going to do. I mean, you're going to waste all that, you know, seven years time where you could start from ground zero into the industry in day one of. You know where you started, and that those experiences going to come in multiple times for you. So, is it harder to break into this industry if you are, you know, say in your mid thirties or after you've done a variety of different experiences, yeah. then you then you want to jump into it? Do you think it's harder? I, I don't think so because I, you know, I, some of the best investors in our industry are actually have people with operational experiences that they, they actually run businesses before, entrepreneurs who started companies, and then they they actually know how to make money already. I mean, as long as those experiences come in, you know, really. It can be very helpful for them to communicate with entrepreneurs in a certain industry. So increasingly, this game is about specialization. The sector knowledge is very important. The, 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 the experience relationship you have with those executives are going to be really important. So if you bring in a lot of industry experience, that could also translate into advantage for you as well. So I, I, I think some of the best investors, actually those guys come with operational experience, actually no banking or, or, uh, or, or you know, consulting experiences. So. Um, I, I think it's a huge advantage having run a company for sure because 
you understand the mindset of the other person on the other end of the table. You know, you understand, um, you understand how that person is also thinking through about the other issues of managing a company, and you're more, you can relate more easily. So I think it's a huge advantage. Um, and back to the issues, I agree with everyone on the panel. I think, you know, in fact, women are quite well equipped to do this 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 job because it requires judgment. Often, being a woman, being slightly on the outside of a male-dominated boardroom gives you a certain different kind of insight and judgment into, into critical issues. Um, I think it requires um, good negotiation skills, both to close deals and to manage existing difficult portfolio managers, management issues. It requires you know, strong relationship skills that often women are actually quite equipped to do. Um, when a difficult situation, the, the softer negotiation skills. Um, and management skills, you know, that managing portfolio companies, managing teams, it's many skills that come quite instinctively and naturally to women are required in this job. Any questions from the audience in terms of how to break into this industry before we move on? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm Katie Seattle. I'm an M&A partner at Simpson Actor. And what some of the panelists are saying about relationships and networking and that women should be very good at this, have you found, I guess as a woman, that um, there are particular strategies or things that you do that are distinct maybe from your male colleagues in terms of networking, whether it's doing the proprietary deal sourcing, forming relationships, you know, with the potential portfolio company CEOs or with, you know, the funds you want to invest in or potential investors in your company. Anyone? Mm -hmm. I think you will develop your own circle of people that you're comfortable with. And if you look at the portfolio companies that you know I would have built over a period of time versus the ones that the guys would have built, you can actually see it's quite different. Um, and so like I, I used to do quite a bit of healthcare and healthcare tends to have more highly educated entrepreneurs. Um, they tend to be more rational uh, when, when you when you talk through terms and all that. And then I'll look at some of my colleagues and guys, they have more like uh, we, we have two deals that are in the uh, white wine business at my job. So it involves very heavy drinking, it involves a lot of alpha male behavior in there. And I think as a manager now, when I put the team together, I try to get as many different talents. We used to call our team the X-Men. Like everybody is, you, you can't see any of us being friends naturally in college, but you put them all together, we somehow get along. So you get an SOE, we had an SOE drinking guy, you have um, you have a, a person who can talk in different languages. You you know you can have people who know different industries. So I think you know as a manager now I can put people different together. But going back to your question, it's like we have an affiliation with certain people, and there's always good deals from those circle of people as well. Um, and don't feel like because I'm not good at drinking because I can't hang out at a bar till three. Um, there's a problem with this. There's no problem uh, with this over the long period. Else the, the drinking aspect is interesting because you know what we talk to in this industry will say, look, you just got a drink to be able to close a deal, you know, and and you get asked that question a lot, you know, as, as a woman, what do you do when it gets to the drinking phase? I bring a guy along. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, it's convenient being a woman, you know, it's just okay. This the, at this point, I just exit, you know. Yeah. Um, and and I don't think it hinders the ability to be taken seriously or or to close a deal yeah. or or to to, to be able to be part of the team or, or whatever, just because you're not in that, like you say, the alpha male drinking culture of, of what's going on in this industry. And that's particularly prevalent now in China, in today's PE environment, and probably will change over time as well. Yeah, it's increasingly, I think, it's, you need to know some industries very well. Um, just the whole, um, a lot less and less about just purity, um, so-called guanxi or relationship and so forth. You have to say something that's, you know, um, somebody respects you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very important for you to really try to study one area of it well. Mm -hmm. And um, um, <coughs> past experiences, past the, you know, relationship, um, it really will speak out for you in, in, in over time. So I think that really helps. And I think women, um, in, in, in many sense, they're actually quite observant and quite, um, uh, very good at, and I think uh, sometimes uh, these days, uh, actually being a woman, sometimes for me actually, strangely works, uh, works, works well. I mean, and uh, because most of the board actually mostly male, and so when you have one female voice, they actually all listen. 
um, <laughs> and because uh, they think it's uh, okay, better listen to this, you know, some, some you know very different voice. And uh, um, I think sometimes you just have to um, kind of think about what your strength is and uh, be good at one or two things, and you can never be good at everything. And that's how um, I, I think I agree with Stephanie that. Um, in our staffing, and we try to assemble people who are good at something. Yeah. No, absolutely agree. I think I think the industry is getting much more professionalized um, now than ever before. So, as, as I think the drinking, uh, you know, the, the bonding, whatnot, that still exists to a certain degree, but um, increasingly, I, I see GP getting a deal. It's not because they have better relationship with the, you know, but it, a lot of times it's really they are there first because they focus on those areas. They have specialty expertise in those areas. They understand the sector very well. They bring something else to the table, um, and uh, that get them the transaction. I mean, a lot of times, the same deal is available to to a lot of people. And at the end of the day, who does it, who doesn't, is really a judgment call. And also, who are, are much more prepared um, at that moment, at that juncture, to make a decision. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't think by any means women should be disadvantaged out of, out of that, you know, out, out of that uh, that process. Um, there was a question on the side. Yes, go ahead. So I have a broader question about the private equity. Hi. Yep. So my broader question is more about the private equity industry in terms of um, the compensation structure, right, and how that sort of limits the flexibility as you think about work-life balance, right? Because obviously a lot of it's tied to that. And part of what Janine and Stephanie said earlier was you got to invest in this in a really long term because. They alluded to the fact that your comp structure is actually tied to it, so the longer you stay in one place, the better off you're going to be, right? Um, how does that factor, I guess, into your minds when you think about, you know, work-life balance? Or obviously, I know you guys all love your job, but, you know, how big a role and what have you heard from, you know, other peers or colleagues in the market? Because obviously that's a really serious issue. And it's not a male-female issue, it's just No, issue, you're right. right, it is. Who's going to talk about first? <laughs> <laughs> Janine? Um, I, 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 as you, you know, pointed out, that uh, the compensation structure that makes this business and, and just uh, uh, in general, it, it is a long term, long term, you know, kind of long term business, and you really, um, you have to kind of, you know, when when I first entered, I didn't know that, and uh, uh, but I always tell people who come into this business that. Uh, don't feel like uh, this is one more transactional type of uh, environment and M&A type of environment. And, uh, um, you know, this is like where you get a couple years, five year experiences and then do something, whatever. And you really have to have a um, mental kind of, uh, well, as anything else. And I think one of the reasons that uh, maybe you do see a few women and uh, is that it is this long-term commitment. Um, you, um, because, Naturally, you know, when the career breaks up by marriages or kids and others, and uh, but the, I think if you mentally prepared, and I think it's uh, and and the work-life balance works up, you know, especially in, in Asia with the support you get and you do work out, and I think it's um, uh, but you have to be mentally prepared and not something, you know, you can never do something very well when you kind of haphazardly thinking event kind of. Go as you go, and yeah, kind of uh, always think about oh, I can always just do this, or I just. And I think it's you. You do have to have a mental commitment, and I think that's, I think that's the way the men think. <laughs> but I think you know, with, with you know, it's interesting because I, I see a lot of the carry scenarios that play out with different funds. Uh, if you are working that fund or in, in that platform, at any given time you should kind of, if you know what you're doing, be able to calculate exactly how much you're leaving at the table. So I think you know, for you at that, at that point is a decision making process, right? It's basically how, many, how much dollars you're giving up for, you know, potentially other reason to stay at home. I think there's there's never a wrong decision in that equation. You stay or you leave. There's never a wrong decision. I mean, I, I'm assuming you're saying, you know, in a couple of years time maybe I want to you know, leave because I have a big family to take care of and whatnot. But uh, you know, I, I really did think there's no no losers on that equation. If you give up and you know you 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 get so much more back, but uh, you should you should actually know exactly what you're giving up from a dollar amount perspective. I was so, laughing when yeah. I saw this line from one private equity woman who says, "I call each of my kids my million dollar babies because of how much each one of them has cost me." <laughs> <laughs> Which is not uh, yeah not understatement. Uh, yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, I think we, we hired a lot of women, entry level and analysts and associate at Luna. Um, and sometimes it's not, it's not even a women or men issue. It's, it's, it's a cultural issue of you know, younger people are short term focused quite often. And um, they look around and they think of peer pressure and who, you know, what's the bank, what are the bankers getting? What are, what are the other industries paying? And, and they're cross referencing what they're making today with what the other person's making. And, and a lot of that short term culture is quite prevalent. And that's difficult to manage because it's really an industry where you're not going to get compensated in the short term. Um, and to be able to you know, make young people understand that is sometimes difficult because, because it's just innate in their the impatience to sort of think that I want validation today. I want, you know. So, you know, for example, we had exit and then, and then people interesting. thought, oh, you know, I'm going to get paid in the next, in my, the next bonus round. Right. And, you know, you have to explain, well, no, it's not how it works. You know, you have to pay your back the LPs and then there's a long process and so Here's an interesting statistic. From the class of 2011, people who have graduated from Harvard Business School, uh, most, uh, within, the average person will switch their job within 18 months, regardless of industry, just to give you a sense. And 30% go into finance. So you can imagine that most people are just looking. Again, there's been this big boom in the tech industry. Everyone wants to be their own, the next Mark Zuckerberg. But uh, it's been interesting to see, to see that. And that's, that's shortened over. You were going to say something. Stephanie. I was going to say the beauty of our industry is actually it's not a market share game. So it's not like how many deals you do in a year. It's how consistent your performance is. So I joke with my husband like if you see him hit the golf ball, it looks very dramatic and it hits and goes way off course, right? <laughs> the I hit, it's always very short hits, but it's always on course. And it's in a funny way, you only have to do two deals a year if it's good consistently. Over a career year, say five years, if you do 10 good deals, you're probably better than almost any private equity professionals on the street. So don't hit all the time, just hit and hit it right. And so that's very different, frankly, from even a legal career or even investment banking career because that business, it's kind of like, you know, done the business, what's your next deal coming from? You're adding the dollars, you know, one by one. And our business is not about that. The worst thing that could happen to you is do a bad deal and have to mop up your own mess. And so that's why I think this business is way more suited for women. <laughs> Hi, yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Marcus Thompson. I'm the CEO of Head of the Capital Partners. Uh, we're a uh, mid market regional private equity firm. And I'd like to ask the panel what advice you would give to the CEO of a GP, private equity firm, to attract and retain uh, more women. By the way, we have uh, uh, more than 20% of our staff are uh, women. Uh, on the investment executive and managerial side, so we're not doing too badly on, on the according to the averages. But I'd be interested to hear panel's views on how uh, we as a firm should uh, could attract and retain uh, more female staff. Attracting at all levels, correct? Yes, all levels. Okay, great question. Uh, I was going to say uh, the difficulty of recruiting into this industry is there's no clear path. There's no like you know fair. There's no, you, you guys will go into college. It's very mystique, and so there's a lot of relationship. There's a lot about hearing who is hiring and then going there and doing and knocking the door ourselves. Women are not good at that stuff. Women want to have a structured program, and so I would really encourage private equity firms to be more disciplined about going on campus talking to people early. Because if you go to Harvard Business School, the last people who are re recruiting uh, are private equity firms. So they wait till June. And then like, who has the guts to have no job and wait until next <laughs> year? <laughs> so I really think you know, it, the private equity firms have to be more disciplined about being on campus at the right time um, so that women have the structure that they, er they yearn for. I didn't know what Goldman Sachs was when I was in college. And the only reason I got a job out of college is because they came on campus and had a women's event, actually. Exactly. And I was like, oh, okay, you're not an ATM company. <laughs> <laughs> I have zero, zero, zero clue. Uh, and by the way, I don't think any of these women want, you know, they're not, they're not poachable. Any other advice? We have the opposite of the problem. We have a lot of women in our office. We actually say, well, next time maybe we'll, we'll try to look for a man. Functional. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, first of all, you know, just the fact that you asked that question, it means that the leadership has that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I think that's a big thing about it. And I think our firm 
um, uh, you know, historically always been the entry class of associates, always been men. I mean, it's like 100% male um, across the board. And uh, only about maybe, I want to say, eight years ago that uh, our leadership and all of a sudden said, wait, I think we went, went to have a, a, a training session with the entry class and found everybody, including themselves, standing in that <laughs> room, all male. Uh, and, uh, and, and had brought this idea saying, actually, I want the next the entire entry class to be female. <laughs> and that happened. Ooh. And uh, when that happened, you of course have some people stay. And, uh, and that's how you have snowballing effect. And the other thing is, we do have uh, referral programs um, that uh, buy internal um, existing employee or investment professionals. And uh, I think that's another way of um, for other people to get to know because as, as our industry, you know, we don't have a recruitment program per se, and also our recruitment only happens when you're next fund or you. It, it, you never know when, and uh, it's not very regular. And unfortunately, it's not a yearly thing. So I think it, it is good to keep in touch with um, the the people who in the industry, um, and then you get to know uh, these opportunities. But I think you know the fact that you're asking that question is a very good sign, and it shows that you you pay you know you a lot of emphasis and that drives the organization. What do you think the biggest hindrance is in getting women to come t to your fund or to the industry in general? Okay, well first I just want to echo Stephanie's point about diversity. I think that's really important uh, both from a deal flow generation perspective, different networks. Uh, secondly, from a decision making perspective that uh, diversity is great as well because the more perspectives you have on a particular transaction uh, I think the better the quality of the decision. So how do I, how do I think um, I've got <laughs> for women who are looking at, at your company and, and also what do you think the biggest hindrance is for women who are looking to uh, get promoted within your company? Do you do you see that okay we're, they're dropping off at this level after a couple of years? Do you see any trends and perhaps what can you do to yeah okay it? so so diversity is important that's first and gender diversity is part of that. Uh, I think it's interesting, so your point about uh, structure and women not being uh, as strong as networking, networkers as men, I think that's an interesting observation because I have to admit we have, in our recruitment, we do go about recruiting, we do work on our uh, personal networks um, and the networks of those of our business partners to see whether uh, there's anyone uh, who might fit in the firm. So that is an interesting uh, observation and something which I'll take into account uh, if, as and when we start our next recruitment. Otherwise, I think we, I think, uh, a little bit is about behavior, actually, within the firm. I think uh, if one allows, uh, shall I say, the male dominated <coughs> behavior to, to occur within the firm, I think that is, uh, is bad. So, and that can be, I try to, as far as I can, uh, shut down any uh, sort of conversation which sort of heads down, heads in that direction, because uh, I feel it's important no one needs to participate in discussions, feel comfortable participating in discussions, and everyone should feel included. That's true. We we have uh, um, lots of networks, and uh, lot less uh, discussion on the sports and some <laughs> <laughs> some discussion on the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I was reading through some of the research I have, and it says that you almost have to downplay having kids. You're not supposed to mention that you're having kids. In fact, one person says, "Don't get pregnant." In fact, the best thing. But in fact, it might be the best to project an active antagonism toward motherhood. We all have kids here. Have you ever felt like you had to do that? Have people come to you and said, "Hey, I, I feel like I'm really nervous about this." Actually, I think having kids help me in terms of the relationship because if you go to an entrepreneur and you have no commonality, either gender or race or whatever, and then you talk about kids, like everybody just melts. And these days in China, the hottest topic is how to get your kids into the boarding schools in America. And if you know anything about that, you're a hot property. So I think that links like your interest level. You're like it, it just makes you way more colorful. Yeah. Having kids makes you both fearless and it makes you interesting. <laughs> I think 
well, the men are women as well. I think men end up talking about their kids a lot as well. It's yes. not yeah, only a, 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 a women's thing. Yeah. But yeah. The, yeah. But yeah. Sorry, just, down, just yeah. on the kids' point, I mean, one of the reasons <laughs> is I have two daughters. <laughs> so I, I, when they grow up and enter the workforce, I want to feel that they have uh, <laughs> equal access to the corridors and right. yeah. so yeah. yeah. that. <laughs> Because you know, clearly, we t I, I often get I often get nervous when I come to speak on women events, and I love Sue May to pieces. But I get really nervous because I don't want to make this about a woman's issue. These are issues that are going to impact males or females. It depends really on who you are and what your background is. Just because you're a male does not mean that you don't get nervous also talking to your boss about a raise or what have you. I think it's important to, to have this conversation because I do think there are very real issues. It, that uh, do keep women behind, but I don't want to make it a woman's issue. It's really more a private equity issue yeah, than it fact, is a woman's now, issue. Things are changing in social dynamics, and in many households, or some households, you have the male taking on the primary caregiver role yeah. within the family, um, and the woman pursuing the career yeah. all the way. So you have different situations, different you know, setups. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's not entirely just a gender specific issue. Right. It's more a work-life balance issue and how you handle it as a family unit. And you, you brought up something really interesting, uh, which is it's so important who you are married to or who your partner is or who your support system is, whether it's a husband or a wife or friends or colleagues or informal mentors that provide you that support. I think that's really important. Choosing those people is really important. Probably the most important though is the person that you are with, that you spend you know, thinking about the chores at home and you spend thinking about the child race. It takes a village, I think, to yeah. have a family. Uh, it takes an yeah, army. Yeah, she has four kids. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It takes an army. I think it's your partner, it's your parents, it's your in-laws, it's your helpers. It's, you know, it's everyone is involved in the process and everyone has a role, I think. I saw another question. Yes, go ahead, the mic, please. Hi, my name is Nina Martinez. I'm a former private equity professional. Um, for anybody on the panel, can you tell a story, perhaps, of any situation where a client may have had an issue with working with a female partner um, and how you overcame that? And kind of a, a related question, if there are any intra-office politics that you've had to overcome, whether it's a land grab for industries or whatnot, how have you dealt with other partners in your own offices um, in terms of being a female? Great. So two-part question. We'll start with the first one. I, 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 I. I really can't think of the situation that um, um, an investee company or the chairman or founder or whatever that had that issue. <coughs> I don't think, um, at least I have not encountered, I guess uh, um, maybe it's a good thing. Or has anyone else? The most, oh, common, sorry, the most common thing that happened to me is I, my team members, if you, any of you have met them, they're really tall guys, right? <laughs> so all the time when we go to meetings, like they, the clients would just stare at them and say, you know, like they just talk as though they're the boss and I just keep my head down. I mean, it, sometimes it's very powerful to be ignored in a room. It's actually really powerful. So you can observe what's going on and then they will, they will always say, by the way, this is the boss. And then they were like, okay. <laughs> and they start turning to you. But like that happens every other day. Yeah. It makes me feel like I'm still young, which is great. <laughs> but you know, if you get over that, if you don't have ego issues, it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. That happens a lot. But they just don't focus on the on the woman because yeah. smaller, you know, right. maybe looks younger or whatever. They just yeah. think, oh, okay, that's, that's part. That's, yeah. but that actually reminds me that when I first joined um, in the 1999, I went to Korea. Well, I guess Korea. Um, but uh, I, I went with. Uh, an, an, Kind of a, a junior person, person, a male um, person, and um, went to a meeting, and uh, and uh, and I just noticed that uh, all these people sitting across the table kept asking me for Mr. Shane's business card, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't quite understand, um, so I kept giving them my business card, and, like, um, and then I realized that they really think I, I was the assistant. I suppose carry his card. Oh, I like that with the business translator or the uh, Actually, I, I was yeah. one, when I first started, yeah. I walked into a room and it was some American from the Midwest in the room and he said, when I opened the door, he said, coffee, no sugar, please. <laughs> and then I looked at him and I said, yes, I'll be right back. <laughs> I got get the coffee, I got one for myself and said, we can start the meeting. My boss is a little late. 
And he was like, oh, can I get you anything else? <laughs> but I think, you know, I always get into these situations, but it's like, you yeah. know, yeah. this is interesting because I was thinking, um, it happened to me a lot earlier, now it's not so much, and also I'm, I have the luxury of being the client all the time, so they do make sure to remember who I am. And, and um, but um, I, I, I did make a point when we have, you know, big boardroom meetings um, to, to be the first one to, to ask a question. Because I, I think you know, women tend to get ignored and your voice tend to be ignored. So if, if you don't jump in right away, soon enough you're just going to be covered by the, the noises. And so I you know, kind of make a point of sort of ask the question early. In so any advice for when she, it sounds like uh, perhaps a client had an issue with the fact that she was a woman. Any advice for how to have that conversation with the client or, or with someone so that that's not a non-issue? No, I'm not in China. No. I think you have to really deliver a message to say that this is where the bucket stops, right? I'm the decision maker. I'm the, you know, I think you have to deliver that message, how the organizational structure works. Because I have to get a lot of requests. Can I talk to your boss? Can I go to somewhere else? Do you have a headquarters somewhere else to make decisions? No, no, the decision gets made here. If you don't bypass here, nothing gets, gets really done. So I think we have to deliver that message over and over again. And then after quite a few times, people kind of get the message. But, you know, I, I don't, know, I don't know if that happens. I think it's interesting yeah. corollary to that is that, I mean, in general, a lot of women talk about, within their career experiences, um, men have not been the issue. In fact, it's other women who have been not supportive. Mm -hmm. and a lot of women talk about that being, being a you know, common theme, at least in the, in the last 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. which, which I think is changing. I think there is a change going on, um, not only here, but just, you know, that's not really. private equity specific, that's really... No, that's, that's in general. Um, if I recall your second question correctly, was it on how to deal with internal politics, which again, I assure you, is not <laughs> just a private equity issue. <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, she was talking a little bit about land grabbing, how do you go about having, how, how do you work to manage the politics? Um, I, I think in private equity, it's, I, I, I hope at least, it's not as the politics is not as prevalent as you know in a larger organization, and because the the structure is so flat, I mean it's so the uh, the you know most of the time the the performance is much more just result driven, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not like you somehow you know burning the midnight oil like you know and try to becoming a, a grabbing this industry, that industry, or something. At the end of the day, if you don't make a good judgment and make a good investment and exit and return money to LPs, it doesn't matter how much land you grab. It, it really, I, I think over time, people, I, I see people, some of the people come from bigger organization coming to, the, coming to our shop, and in the beginning, they all try to do that, and eventually they figure it's kind of, it's just a, a waste of time doing it and much more try to focus on looking at the company, knowing what you're doing and make a good judgment, of, you know. And I think it's it's just a much more efficient way of spending, your, <laughs> having your energy spending, uh, spending the time than uh, trying to elbowing others and uh, doing that. And I think it's because it, it's a different business model. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's really managing money versus managing people. So I think as a partner in the firm, in a private equity firm, you're expected to invest, uh, you know, generate returns, and in a fundraise, maybe that's sort of another role that you play. But you do not really expect to manage, you know, sort of each other. So that, from that perspective, I do think it's, it's a friendly industry from a politics uh, perspective. At least right. I, as an investor, do not expect politics, too much politics in, in the, even the larger organizations, right, which I think is uh, overall just one less headache to have. And just mm -hmm. <coughs> and whatever you produce shows up in your track record. That's really what you have to show for. Um, but if anything, as a as an advice for younger people to to you know women professionally in any industry, I guess finance particularly to get noticed. It, it, I think I, you know this lean I really you know like the book a lot. I think women just don't put themselves in the right position to be noticed um, sometimes and. And um, if that's a form of politics, then let, let it be. Let, you know, let, let you sort of put yourself in those positions where you're visible to the senior management. I think that's really, really very important because as the firm gets larger, people are just not going to have the attention and, and the time to notice who's the rising stars. And if you don't put yourself in those positions, you might be you know, sort of, you know, covered for a long time. So I, I think if there's anything, 
Yeah. That's a great point, Michelle. So you run your own show, mm -hmm. so you are the boss. You probably can comment on how maybe you try to squash office politics and how you would encourage women to present themselves for you. Um, I, I don't think of it so much in gender terms. I mean, I think in general, um, if you're good at what you do, that's recognizing its own merit, whether you're, you're male or female, I think. Uh, but I think that um, if you are good at what you do, and you are driven and you're passionate about what you do, you will, you will rise to the occasion, you'll be noticed by, 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 by senior management in general, um, whether male or female. Um, but I do believe in, in what the lean-in um, philosophy in terms of there needs to be sort of more both culturally mindset issues, you know, more, more awareness of, of the need to promote women, the need for more women at backed funds. Um, there needs to be institutional support in terms of whether it's flexible work arrangements, whether it's stronger recruitment policies uh, or drive towards bringing women in the industry. There needs to be both from the mindset level and the institutional level, greater awareness of these issues and greater effort put behind these issues. The other thing I would add is like, um, you should give more credit to your boss because they could see through politics pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all kind of kid ourselves like, you can't see that, they totally see that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, my policy is I will play defensive, but I've never played offensive. So don't mess with me, but I will mess with you. So that's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, like I think for women, um, that's probably the most, the best position to be in, and just be very matter of fact. I know, you know, I know Jenny for many years. She's very direct, and I think it helps. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it at that. Thank you so much. Hopefully, this conversation was inspiring and made you think of even more questions that probably we could take another hour to discuss. But sadly, because of time, we're gonna have to leave it there. But thank you so much for taking the time to end. I will uh, to attend. I will not pass it to there. <laughs>